All right, good morning. I know some of you are still waiting to come in, so you'll be popping in here in the middle, but welcome to our virtual ag tour with Arizona Farm Bureau Ag in the Classroom. My name is Katie Akins, and I'm so excited for us today to be traveling to Marana, Arizona to our Bayer greenhouses. But before I turn it over to our special guests, I would like to remind you of a few housekeeping things for today. So one, um, you do not have the ability to unmute yourself. So if you do have a question throughout today's tour, go ahead and enter it in the chat box and we will be sure that we uh, ask your question to our special guests today. Um, if you like somebody else's question, go ahead and you can promote it. Um, but again, just put your questions in the chat box. We will make sure we get to it today. Um, we are scheduled to be here for about 50 minutes today. If you have to leave us before we're done, it's okay. Remember, we will put the recording out on our website later this afternoon, so you can pop back in and see what you missed. But without further ado, I would like to turn it over to our guests of the day. Um, our first guest that we're going to be talking with is Stephanie Bow from Bayer. And I'm going to stop my screen here so we can get her live. Great. All right, Stephanie, you are <laughs> unmuted and ready to go. Good morning. Awesome. Good morning, everybody. We're so excited to welcome you into the Bayer Marana Greenhouse today. I'm not actually in the greenhouse quite yet. I thought I would stop in here where we're putting our plants into our pots. So while we had a little action going, I thought I'd stop in and check this out. So our employees are basically taking our tiny baby corn and putting them into a pot. And then if you can see the crane, that red crane there, that is going to take all those pots that are going to go onto a bench and they're going to put them out in the greenhouse. And we're going to go out there in just a little bit after my friends and my colleagues, Megan and April, take us on a little bit more of a tour of what we do here at the Marana Greenhouse. So I feel like I'm tossing next to Megan to talk a little bit about why we do what we do. Good morning, Megan. Thanks, Stephanie. Good morning, everyone. I hope, can I do a mic check just to make sure you can hear me okay? Awesome, thanks. So my name is Megan Dickens. I lead our production operations team here in Marana, Arizona. Um, my team's really responsible for taking the seed that's delivered from our partners, planting it, transplanting, growing, pollinating, which we'll look at in a little bit, harvesting that seed and then sending it off downstream for the next round of testing. But before we get into a lot of the nitty gritty details about what it is that we do here at Marana, I wanted to start with kind of a simple story that for me really resonates about why we care so much about agriculture and ultimately what we Bayer are trying to do here. And it all starts with a watermelon, which may seem a little bit odd because we do grow corn here, but who doesn't love a good watermelon? And conveniently enough, watermelons come in the shape of this beautiful planet that we live on, planet Earth. So what I want to do is kind of talk a little bit about what and why and even how agriculture exists on this beautiful planet of ours. So what I'm going to do, it's a little bit science and a little bit fun, but I'm going to dissect this watermelon. So I've already cut it in half and I've cut one of my halves in half again, and I'm gonna set about 75% of this watermelon aside. So this is representing something that takes up the majority of our planet. If you know what it is, you can say it out loud to your friends and family around you, but this is representing the oceans. So right now, not really a place, and historically hasn't been a place where we can grow food. Other things thrive there, but this isn't what we think about when we talk about agriculture. So that leaves me with this. And this is going to represent the earth that we live on, the land that we live on, that is actually capable of sustaining life and farming. However, I'm going to cut this in four pieces. And I now want to look at each of these pieces. And so what's left here is our land, but there's a lot of stuff on the land, right? We've got mountains 
and swamps and polar ice caps where people really can't, really can't live. We've got cities and highways and parks and golf courses, which are really important to keeping us happy and healthy and thriving. And then we've got actually the place, the places that we live, our homes. Though that is land that we could potentially use for farming, we're using that for other reasons right now. Which leaves me with this little sliver, which is, if you're really into fractions, 1 32nd of our original watermelon. So this is what we have on planet Earth that is free, open, and capable of supporting the food growing land that we need to support the billions of people we have on this planet. If there are any soil scientists out there, you will know that in reality, not all of this piece of watermelon is actually capable or of good enough quality to support growing food. What is, is actually just this tiny little piece of topsoil. This is what we have available to us right now to support all of the agriculture needed to feed our world today and the growing population that we have in the coming years. So one of the things that Bayer is looking at doing is how can we produce crops, all kinds of crops, not just corn, though that's a favorite here locally, how can we produce crops that can make the most amount of food or seed or fiber on this tiny little piece of land that we do have? Really critically important as we have a growing, growing global population. The other really cool thing that we do is actually start to look at this piece of the watermelon and even some of these to see if we can start to develop either through traditional breeding techniques or even using advanced technologies, if we can start to grow crops on pieces of land or in places where maybe historically we haven't, but we now need to look at as an opportunity for us to do more with what we have. And so what I wanna do with my tiny little sliver of topsoil on my 132nd piece of this earth is turn it over to April Carroll to talk a little bit about what we do here, a little bit about why plant breeding and why it's a really cool thing to think about as you move through your educational experience. So April, if you are there, I'm gonna to toss the ball to you. Hi, Megan. Thank you, everyone, for being here today and for interest in studying and learning about agriculture. So I have a few slides today, um, <clears throat> but maybe just a quick intro of myself. Um, I am a plant scientist. Um, so I've been studying for a long time um, to learn about the basics of science and why plants work, why they're important, and how we can use plants to really um, improve kind of human life and the human condition. So I am going to share my slides here. Um, oh my goodness. I don't see how to share. Can someone help? Oh, share screen. Got it. Wonderful. Can you guys see that? <clears throat> Mic check. Okay, thank you. Yep, we're good. All, all right. So, um, so learning about plants, I became really interested in studying plants um, when I first learned about genetic modification. So, I was so interested in the fact that we could change just little tiny bits of the plant's DNA or an animal's DNA, anything like that, and not harm the plant and not make anything dangerous, but just the ability to actually change little sequences to make the plant taste better, to make it have more vitamins, to make it able to survive under a hailstorm or something really, really extreme like that. And so I was hooked the minute that I saw plant biology and learning about genetic modification I wanted to learn more. So I went to college 
to study plants. Um, I studied all about DNA. I studied about all the molecules within the plants and cells. Um, and now I'm here at Marana um, working with other colleagues like Stephanie and Megan, who are also women in science, but who want to learn and study more about plants and help feed the world. So <clears throat> the reason that I chose to study plants was because we have a hugely growing population right now, and we're going to have to feed another 50% more people on this planet in the next 30 years, and that is not going to be easy. So Stephanie and Megan and I and our colleagues all take it very personally that we want to make sure that everyone on the planet doesn't go to bed hungry. So we're looking for ways to make that hunger not so not so severe. Um, we're looking for ways to tolerate climate change, um, to use less water or fertilizer, um, more nutritious, and a bunch of things like that that I'll talk a little more about in, um, in these later slides. Um, so who thinks that plant breeding is something new? Does anybody think that, oh, I just heard about GMOs, we're going to breed plants, it's brand new, right? It's it's been around for 40,000 years we've been plant we've been breeding plants. So every time that a person has selected one plant and crossed it to another, we end up with a new crossbreed, a new hybrid, and we are actually changing the DNA every time we select for bigger berries or taller stalks. Um, so we look very different over time when humans start to guide breeding. So plants, animals all reproduce on their own within their natural environments. But when humans influence how those plants grow and thrive, we call it selective breeding. So you can see an example over here of how humans have selectively bred wolves. So the, the dogs that we have, does anybody have a dog or at home? I have a little dog, she's asleep under here. She's not trying to chew my face or anything like a wolf would. Um, she's just there chewing on her little bone and taking a nap. So the wild wolf was really the natural species and humans over time selected dogs that were some, some of them were small and cute and cuddly. Other ones were really good at hunting and retrieving um, different say birds or ducks. Um, so there was um, even dogs that are bred to herd animals like cattle and sheep. So this is an example of how humans have selectively bred dogs over many, many generations. And in doing that, by selecting the little cute one that wants to sit on my lap, I'm actually changing the DNA generation over generation. And so that's just one example maybe that might be close to home, but we're doing the same thing in plants by making bigger, healthier, more nutritious plants. And we have ways to do that now that are so precise, we can actually use a little tiny molecular pair of scissors to cut out little chunks of the DNA and put back in the chunks that will make the plants healthier, um, more nutritious, or more resilient to climate change. Um, so here's just a few examples, like the example of the wolf breeding into the little cute dog on the lap or asleep under my desk. Um, we have been selectively breeding for plants for 40,000 years, and here's just some recent examples of what wild plants look like. So on the top there, Megan just cut up a beautiful red watermelon with no seeds. Um, she was able to cut that flesh, and I wanted to actually just take a bite. Um, I might just have to go up to Megan's office and go get some watermelons for snacks. But this is what they look like only 350 years ago. Plant, this is from an oil painting um, where they're showing this, this watermelon with, um, you know, tons of seeds, not very good red flesh. Um, and the same thing goes for banana. So we've been selectively breeding bananas over a couple hundred years as well. And now we have these nice, um, the little wild banana is only that big, it's full of seeds. And the same thing with the wild mustard plant. We now have bred that into broccoli. Um, and there's a really neat story. I won't go into too much detail about it. Um, but this wild mustard is the same species as broccoli, um, and that broccoli is actually the same species as cauliflower, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, kale, um, so they're all members of the same mustard species. All right, so one of the other goals is to reduce fertilizer use. So we have a big impact on the planet when we grow crops. Um, we end up with fertilizer in places that we don't want it to be. So if we can make our crops use the fertilizer more efficiently, then the fertilizer won't end up in our natural ecosystems. Um, we also want to improve nutrition. Um, so we've been working on biofortified foods. So this is an example of a genetically modified plant. 
um, where rice is a staple diet for about 75% of the people on the planet. So by adding um, just a small little gene, a little piece of DNA, we're able then to provide vitamin A for people um, in areas where they don't have it in their diet. And if you don't have vitamin A in your diet, you can actually go blind. So it's really important for good eyesight. We're very fortunate here in the US. Um, but so we also have enriched rice with, with um, iron and then with tomatoes to have more of those healthy antioxidants to help uh, our bodies fight all kinds of infection. Okay, so just a few more real quick, um, kind of beyond food uses for plants. Um, a lot of the drugs that we've discovered are natural products coming from plants. So caffeine, um, vitamin C, vitamin A, morphine, all naturally occurring in plants. Um, we can also use plants to make safe and effective vaccines and antibodies. So things like the coronavirus being the vaccine being produced in massive quantities, that's something in the future that we'll be able to put into things like a banana so that you don't have to get a shot. You might just be able to go in and eat a banana to get your vaccine. And that would be much more pleasant every year to get my flu shot in a banana instead of in, um, in my arm. Um, so we also use plants to create wood. So wood is made up of plant cell walls. So you can see here some really elaborate architecture that's been around for a thousand years in these old buildings. Plants are really what makes that happen. Um, we use plants, here's a picture of cotton. Um, we use um, all kinds of plant fibers as fabrics um, to weave into cloth. Um, we also use plants for biofuels. So by growing corn plants, we can actually use that as gas for our car instead of digging up uh, fossil fuels that are not sustainable. Um, and then finally, this renewable energy concept. Um, scientists are looking for ways to convert plants into plastics so that we also don't have landfills full of garbage that they'll actually just be able to break down. So Megan and Stephanie are going to give you a little bit more of a tour of where, what we do in Marana for Bayer. Um, so just maybe to recap, um, we have to produce more food in the next 40 years than in all of human history. Um, we need to adapt to changing climates and produce more renewable resources. So um, I am just really excited to be here and talk about my career and my passion for science. And these two ladies that you're going to talk to next are going to show you kind of the synthesis of plant science and engineering. So I will turn it over to Megan and Steph. April, thank you so much. I'm going to go over to Megan. Thanks everyone. So Stephanie's also got a really nice shot if you don't wanna look at me, but I'm gonna try to keep you connected with what's happening behind. So I have been in greenhouse production for, this is my 15th year with the company and I have never worked in a facility like this one. The really interesting part here and kind of to April's sort of toss over to us conversation is this isn't just about agriculture and breeding. This is about technology and innovating for the future. And to be a tiny little part of it um, here in Marana is a really awesome opportunity. And I think this is such a great opportunity for us to share with you all what agriculture is becoming. So I really want to start kind of at the high level here. And why the heck did we build a greenhouse in Arizona? Anybody have a guess? Arizona, it's beautiful. There's mountains. The desert is more gorgeous than I ever imagined. Um, but there's a heck of a lot of sunlight. And one thing plants need is light to do what they do. So one of the reasons we're here is to take advantage, full advantage of all of that beautiful sunlight. We do get cloudy days. And so if you look kind of up behind me, you can see we do also have supplemental lighting. And that's just to ensure that we give this crop everything that it needs in order to grow quickly and produce a lot of seed. One of the things we do also do is control the environment in here. So Arizona, even this time of year, it's crazy. One day it's 80 and the next day it's 55. Crops don't respond really well to that. We can put on a jacket or we can choose a tank top over a long sleeve. But what we try to do here inside of our greenhouse, which in fact is kind of a mini controlled environment, is give the crops again exactly what they need. Not just light, but things like temperature, humidity, the length of the day. Those are all things that the crops respond to in order to reproduce effectively. 
Um, so up above, just a little bit about greenhouse structure, we've got heating and cooling, we have lighting, we have misting um, that makes it nice. And really from a corn plant, it's about getting really good and a lot of pollen that we can then use to pollinate the ears on the plants to make a full ear of corn. So what's happening behind me is also a really another unique feature of this greenhouse. We have maximized or taken advantage of every square inch of prime growing space in the middle of this greenhouse, which essentially means that even if I wanted to, I can't turn around and walk out there to those plants. They're right there, but I can't get to them. So what do I do? We have an automation system in place that actually moves the benches around. Um, and if you keep your eye behind me, you'll see them move in. But essentially, our teams here can say, I want to look at that bench of corn that's out in the middle of a greenhouse, program it in on a computer, and the computer will drive software and robotics to bring that bench around the greenhouse to a workstation on the far side where the people are. And what the people are doing there is looking at the ears, the new young developing ears of corn that are growing, and you can see some of those are actually covered with little white bags. And the reason we do that is because we wanna make sure that exactly the right pollen goes to exactly the right ear at exactly the right time. And we do that by controlling it in a way. And so we know exactly what we're doing. Um, and then we can document that through data collection. So this is some material that's on the early end of reproduction. And so over the course of the next few days and weeks, we'll start to see the male parts, the tassel at the top of the plant come out. We'll collect that pollen and then very carefully pour it on those young ears in order to make a pollination, which ultimately will produce corn seed that we can then send on to our next step in our process. One of the other really cool things about this facility that personally fires me up is that we are in the middle of a desert. We are also operating, if you remember that thin skin of watermelon, how this facility is one of the ways that we're trying to step out our opportunity to grow in places that we normally don't grow. Sometimes that involves building a structure, sometimes that's putting new kinds of plants in the ground. But in here, we want to be really good stewards of this 40-acre parcel of land that we're sitting on. So we take things from a sustainability standpoint very seriously. Being in Arizona with all that sun allows us to not run the lights as frequently as we would say if we were in a greenhouse in Wisconsin or Canada. So we can take full advantage of the sun to offset some energy usage by just naturally bringing that into the building. Water in the desert is kind of a big deal. And so what we do here is actually grow our plants on tables. What's a little bit hard to see here is that those tables actually will be filled with water so that the benches will be flooded. The plants will pull up that water and any water that they don't use is actually recaptured and sent through a system to essentially an on-site water treatment plant where we will clean it, sterilize it, re-add the nutrients that that corn plant needs to grow healthy and strong, and then send it back out again. So it's almost a completely closed loop system where we're able to recapture over 95% of the water that we use. Uh, Megan, thing, we do, oh. really really quick, we do have a couple of questions. Sure. You did a really good job explaining why, why those plants are moving and, and how they're moving around those benches back there. Um, but two things, somebody wants you to explain again what exactly supplemental lighting is um, and what are you guys using? Is it LED or what is it? And then also, where exactly in Marana is your greenhouse facility? Sure, thank you. So supplemental lighting means we're just adding more light when we don't get enough from the outside. So say we get a stretch, say monsoon season, and it's really cloudy, and we may go hours or even days without seeing a decent amount of sunlight. We can turn on our lights to make sure that our crop gets the overall amount of light every day that it needs to grow at the pace we need it to grow. What we use here in Marana are HPS, or high pressure sodium lights, which are fairly standard in the industry. Um, LEDs are something that we've deployed in some other spaces. Metal halides are also used in other facilities, though here we're really focused on those HPS lights. Um, in terms of location, we are just west of Marana High School 
north, a little northwest of Marana High School. Um, uh, another question, we know there in Marana, you guys focus specifically on corn. So that is your, your main crop. Are there plans to expand that greenhouse facility to grow additional crops or will you focus specifically on corn always? I think in the short term, we're really focused on growing corn, but I sincerely hope we look at some other opportunities. Our breeding pipeline is very wide and diverse in terms of what types of plants that we work with. Um, so hopefully, hopefully that's something on the horizon for us. Do we have any more questions? All right, one, one other thing I might add here before, before I kick it over to Stephanie, we did talk a little bit about sustainable use of water, but um, supplies and other media or substrates, growing media that we use um, are also part of sustainability. We don't wanna send really anything to the landfill if we don't have to. And so all of the pots, the benches and a fair number of other supplies that we use in that space that Stephanie started our conversation in, um, we reuse. So we will wash and sanitize those and redeploy those back into production. And really only should something break to a point where we can't use it, will we not pull that back into our system. Um, the corn plant, when it reaches the end of its growing life cycle and it's produced a good looking ear of corn, we will harvest that corn and process that seed again to send it off to the next step. But we're left with soil and the, the top part of the corn plant, the leaves and the stalk. And so what we do here on site, similar to water, is we have an on-site compost facility. So that soil and all of the vegetative material that's left heads out to our compost facility where we manage um, all of that waste break it down over a number of weeks, and then eventually turn that newly created soil out onto our property. And so it's a really great opportunity for us, again, to continue to reuse in the hopes of doing more in the future with that. And when you say the corn stays there for um, one plant cycle, can you help our audience understand how long does that take to produce an ear of corn? Sure, so, so we are growing corn from all over the world. Um, and frankly, material that grows in Canada grows a little bit differently than something in Southern Mexico, for example. Um, so what we try to do is kind of flatten out that curve and roughly on the order of three to four months on average, it will take from a seed starting in soil when we first plant it to seed harvested and in a packet and ready to ship on to the next step. And how many acres are under glass there for your greenhouse to give these folks an idea of just how big it is? And um, as a secondary question to that, how many corn plants can you have in the greenhouse? Sure, so our greenhouse facility is about seven acres of the under glass component um, and tens of thousands of plants at any given moment in time. So for our friends who are wondering what an acre is, an acre is about the size of a football field. Mm -hmm. So imagine seven football fields within that glass structure. Pretty cool when you think about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Katie, it's amazing. This is Stephanie again. Some of our employees get about 20,000 steps a day as they walk through our facility and take care of our baby plants. It's absolutely amazing. I wanted to take just a quick moment too, to I'll get in the camera really quick, um, just to talk a little bit about why corn is so important to our entire world. And so we're not growing the kind of corn here that you're going to eat at your house, like as a, you know, nice, juicy, sweet corn. We're growing the kind of corn that goes into things like biofuels and feed for animals, but also a lot of great products that are in our homes right now every day. So one thing I have right here is a case on my phone that my son 3D printed for me on his 3D printer. And this filament right here is made out of a corn product. And so that's one way that we can use corn in, in the world. Um, dryer sheets that go into your dryer also contain a component of corn, Crayola crayons, Windex, 
um, the outside coating of Bayer aspirin that maybe your mom, dad, or grandpa takes for their heart, that outside coating is a component of corn. So we have a lot of uses for corn just throughout our lives. And it's really amazing when you start to think about it that corn is just all around us, wallpaper, it's in carpeting. Um, and so it's a component that's really important. And so when we say corn is king, it really is one of the number one crops across the globe for those reasons. So what we do here is really, really early in that development of this corn. So it'll be, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say six to 10 years and Megan, correct me if I'm wrong, six to 10 years before our corn uh, grows in the field of a farmer somewhere in the world. And so we are surrounded by these amazing scientists and plant health people here at the Marana Greenhouse who are not just thinking about the farms of today, they are thinking about the farms of the future. You know, when, if you're in elementary school right now, it's the corn that could be grown when you're in high school. So it's a really cool part of the process here. So if you're thinking about studying any kind of science, we actually use almost all the different kinds of science right here in the greenhouse. So we have people like April and, and her team who are using data. You know, they're collecting all this information about what we do here and helping us make better decisions with that. And then we have people who literally they, you know, are, are using their science for engineering. So um, amazing people here and um, wonderful career path. If you've been thinking about what you want to do with your life, um, this has robotics, engineering, plant science. I'm trying to name them all. Um, but for me, it's a totally different experience. I grew up, um, I, my first career, I should say, was in broadcast journalism. And so I'm here to just help tell our story. And I have learned so much in the last three and a half years about science that I, it's just mind blowing and I'm learning every day. So science is cool. I'm gonna give it a two thumbs up. <laughs> now, Stephanie, I know this, um, this next question that I'm gonna throw out there from Ms. Pell's class is probably a, a little bit more in depth than you can go here with us today. But the question is, how do you turn the corn into the different products? So you're talking corn plastic, dryer sheets, um, those sorts of products. How does the corn become those things? Oh boy, April or Megan might need to help me with that, that one. That's honestly something that I have not really looked into, but it's I, I'm assuming that that corn gets put into different components. You know, it's broken apart as it goes through the processing. And so it'll go from becoming that seed to becoming basically the different parts of corn. Megan or April, do you wanna help me out with that one? So I know April had to jump off cause she had a conflict. Maybe Megan will come back in, but I know it's the polymers from the corn, but here's Megan. So she'll be more scientific about it. Yeah, uh, thanks for the setup. I don't want to like lower the bar a little bit, but I think that is kind of past the point at which we really are engaged. And frankly, I have been. But to what Stephanie said, it's really about, you know, we're producing the starting product. Um, and it's sort of how, again, it's broken down into the individual component parts that feed all of those channels that ultimately turn into the next round of products. And so whether it goes through like a manufacturing type facility, um, but it's really how you're breaking down, whether it's oil versus starch versus ground, um, you know, thinking about like a flour kind of base, I, that's ultimately where this goes to then be turned into the next, the next product essentially. Megan, that was basic level. That was perfect. Um, we do have a question from Miss Vega's class at Sossaman Elementary in Queen Creek, and they would like to know, can you explain to them a little bit more about how the pollination process works there in the greenhouse? They actually just finished learning about bees um, and studying bees and pollination. So do you guys have any bees there in the greenhouse or how do you do that there? We, I'm looking at Stephanie, you want me to take this one? Um, we have human bees. We're all little bees. We're all little worker bees here. Um, this is like my favorite, this is my favorite place out here. But essentially, um, you can't really see it, but on the far side of the greenhouse, there's an elevated platform where these benches will actually roll off onto so that our worker bees can walk all the way around the bench and access every plant on that bench. 
And so what we'll do is, um, you know, we use bags. So there's two different types of bags, one to protect that developing ear, which are those white ones that you see behind me. And maybe it's a little far away, but if you look down here, you can see some brown bags, like brown paper bags. Um, those are what we collect the pollen in. So those start up on top of the plant once we have that good, well-formed male reproductive part, the tassel, where the anthers are that hold the pollen. So we'll put a bag around the tassel and we'll shake it like a Polaroid picture. Maybe some folks get that. Um, we'll shake it to collect the, the pollen in that bag. Take the bag down and very carefully remove remove the cover of the ear and pour the pollen on the silk. So if you've ever actually really looked at a corn plant, either an ear that hasn't been pollinated or even an ear that has that you buy at the store, all those little silks that stick out the top, the fibrous bits, are actually little pollen tubes. And so what we're trying to do is get at least one healthy pollen grain on every one of those silks that will then travel down into that ear and make a seed. So think about that the next time you husk an ear of corn and you get frustrated because there's all that silk. Think about the magic that had to happen in order for that full ear of corn to actually be on your dinner table or in your dryer sheet. It's pretty amazing when you think about it. Um, I know outside of Bayer, you know, there are there are people working on new types of automation that could replicate that activity. If you've never pollinated a corn plant, there's a little bit of science, but a lot of art. You have to know exactly the right time to sync up that activity, to match that activity when the female ear and the male tassel are ready. And if you don't get that at just the right time, you don't get any seed or you don't get all the seed. And so there's almost an art dare I say, a feeling that you get after working with corn for a while that allows you to almost identify you can talk to the plant um, and know just the right time. So I think that's one of the really cool parts about our facility is that we do have an incredible amount of automation and robotics, but at the end of the day, it still takes people doing this to actually get it to the finish line. Oh, great exp explanation. And I do just want to circle back to Ms. Vega's class. You will go into some greenhouses that actually bring beehives into the greenhouses for pollination, but that's usually in the greenhouses that are working specifically for commercial production. So mm -hmm. maybe it's the nature suite greenhouses producing all of our tomatoes and they need that pollination, but they're not as concerned about keeping the genetics um, and the research surrounding that genetics um, so tight. So that is the difference. Yep. Great explanation. Yeah, I wanted um, to jump in really quick. Katie just mentioned the bugs we do have inside. We have ladybugs in here. And part of that is our strategy to really help us use the good bugs to battle against any bad bugs we might have in the greenhouse. And so I was in our administration building yesterday and a little ladybug was there and I was so excited to see it. We bring them in on purpose because they do such great work. And then outside of our building, we do have our own pollinator garden that we've been working on for the last uh, year or so. Um, it's been such an amazing project um, using native species so that we can attract our own pollinators. And that is something our company does too, is, you know, helping people understand why we should help our pollinators out in the world. And so anytime, anytime we get a chance, we're talking about monarch butterflies. And of course, we have bats and other things here that are pollinators. And um, just being out in that garden is so relaxing and it's been such a great thing for us to have on our property here. And that's new since you visited us last time, Katie. So um, we'll have to show that to you next time you can come down when we're not in COVID anymore. <laughs> Definitely, and um, before I get to the next question from our Casa Grande FFA, um, to your point there, when you say I come there, do you guys do any sort of school tours when COVID is, is not in the picture? Is that something that schools can do or is it always virtually or are there any opportunities for them to come see in person? You know, that is a really complicated question right now. So definitely before COVID, that was a big part of our plan was to really bring people inside and, and be very transparent, which means, you know, where our doors are open, we want to show people what we're doing here in the greenhouse. 
But unfortunately, COVID has really changed, I mean, for everybody, right? We've changed everything that we're doing, and it's really tough for us to kind of answer that question right now. My hope is that we will get back to that. Um, but one thing we're noticing is how many more people we can reach through the virtual platforms because it doesn't take, you know, Casa Grande, you would take a whole day to come down here and do a tour with us and you'd have to pack your lunch and you'd have to have permission slips, but you don't have to do that when we do a virtual tour. It really breaks down those barriers and I know how hard it is to get the funding to do a uh, tour of a facility, right? You've got to rent your bus and all of those kind of things. And those were challenges we were thinking about before COVID was how would we help teachers afford to pay for their field trips to come here? So I feel like we're not going to be able to really talk about that again until 2022 at this point. Um, so for 21, we're sticking with virtual. And then, you know, if the world goes back to normal, we can go back to normal, hopefully too. Well, our Casa Grande advisor said um, he would definitely still bring his students, even if it took the whole day. So they're looking forward <laughs> to when your doors are open and, and people can come visit. But to their question there in Casa Grande, they would like to know how many species of corn are you growing there right now? Megan's unmuting. That's definitely yeah, a Megan sorry. question. So sorry. <laughs> Um, so, you know, it's really, it's essentially a single species, but we have different populations that come from across our, our world regions. And so there's slight variations. For the most part, they are very similar, but depending on what we're trying to do, where and for whom, um, they do come in as a little bit different. One of the challenges, if I may highlight, um, in doing what we're doing here is that we have to find to, a way to grow material from Canada alongside material from Brazil or Southern Mexico. And they need very different things, but we have to try to find kind of a middle ground where all of the plants are happy, maybe not thriving, but happy. Um, and we can keep them on that three to four month cycle that we need to push them through our system and onto the next phase. And Megan, you've said a couple of times that it takes kind of that three to four month cycle. So does that mean you get um, three crops each year or how does that work? It's a, it's a little bit different for us in that we can plant year round, right? So essentially we have a new crop at least every week. Um, and so it's, it's sort of a constant sliding scale, but if you step back and look at it as a whole, it is essentially three to four main cycles that we get through the year. Excellent. Well, um, if you guys want to fill a little bit of the time, we will allow a couple of more questions to come in. We are wrapping up here with our time, but we definitely have appreciated you guys. Um, oh, we do have a question for, and I know you'll each have to answer this because this will be different for each of you, but um, some of the students would like to know how much schooling uh, or how many years of schooling was required for what you do, and can either of you um, answer for April as well if hers is different? Yeah, for April, she has a PhD. So she did her bachelor's, her master's, and then her PhD. And I am feeling like that's about a nine year process, maybe even a little bit longer than that. And you do things like um, you teach while you're, you're working through that, which is why she did such a great presentation on plant science for us today. Um, and you know, it's amazing for me to work with these women who have gone through so much schooling because I, I just couldn't do that. That wasn't right for me. Um, I ended up though taking six years to get through college because I worked full time um, and while I put myself through college. So really a broadcast journalism degree is probably only four years, but I learned so much on the job with every job that I've done. And I really encourage you to think about that. You know, you can go to college for one thing like I did broadcast journalism, but then you might end up in a career you never expected like working in this amazing greenhouse. And so um, I always like to think about it as a T. So um, if you think about the T, the long way, that's how your, your deep understanding of what you're studying is. And then if you spread your arms out across the T, that's all the other cool stuff you could be learning about that might lead you to a career you just never even thought of. What about you, Megan? 
Yeah, my 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 educational experience is very similar to Stephanie's. So I have a four year bachelor's degree in actually not really anything related to this, which I think is a, an important message for me to share with this group. Um, I studied forestry and environmental resource management. Um, and I thought that I wanted to go into environmental education and teaching, um, which is part of the reason why I love doing things like that watermelon exercise where we started at the beginning. Um, I sort of fell into a career with this company that helped me develop more skills on the job that I actually, they, they serve me very well in this role, but I don't want to undervalue in any way some of the soft skills that maybe we don't talk about enough um, in, in science realms or even in agriculture. Um, leadership, public speaking, you know, being able to provide your opinion and influence. I think there's a lot of other skills that you gain, sometimes without even knowing it, but if you become a little bit more intentional about thinking about that as you're going through more of the technical education process, that's a foundation like Stephanie's T that you can also build from um, and learn in new avenues some of those, those technical pieces as well. And so a lot of what I've done here has been really working on developing some of those soft skills and interacting with folks like you while also learning the technical pieces on the job. Megan, so. thank you so much for bringing, out, uh, bringing up how important those soft skills are, because I think oftentimes those are overlooked. So mm -hmm. thank you for bringing that up. We do have a question that has come in um, regarding your water. So where does the farm get its water from? Is it groundwater? Is it CAP? What are you guys at? And what percentage of your water is recycled with a typical crop? That's awesome. I can take the first part of that question. Um, we have our own well right here on our site. And one of the um, amazing things about this property is that it was a farm for a really long time. And so it had its own well when we purchased this property. But we are using, I want to say, a tenth of the water that that traditional farm used. And so we are really saving the water, you know, that we are allotted. We don't use all of it. And then I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, Megan, we're 90% plus recycled water. Mm -hmm. So we're not letting those precious drops go away. They, um, you know, obviously we lose a little bit to evaporation, but the rest of it we're keeping here and recycling and recapturing. And that water that's lost in evaporation just goes back to the water cycle. So it's not really right. lost, it's just in a different form. That's true. <laughs> Awesome. Well, that looks like the end of questions here. Ladies, you did a fabulous job. I know that's always, you don't know what's coming at you, but um, you were able to handle them well. So I sure appreciate that. I'm going to go um, and share my screen at the moment, unless you have any last things to say. Stephanie, I see you popping in there. <laughs> nope. Just wanted to make sure I could wave. <laughs> All right, well, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with them just so that they can get your contact information. Um, so I'm gonna be sharing with each of you Stephanie Bowe's contact information here on the screen. Um, so if you have any additional questions um, or you think of something after we all jump off here today that you wanna be able to ask, there is Stephanie's information there on the screen. We appreciate you all for joining us today and we look forward to meeting with you again for next month's virtual tour. Bye guys. Thanks everybody.